So this is John Costa at the Documentary Media Centre uh, on Tuesday, the 2nd of November. Um, and I'm catching up with a very good friend of the Parallel Lives Network and a very good friend of mine as well and the Doc Media Centre, uh, Kavita Ashok in New Delhi in India. So uh, good morning from me and a good afternoon from you. Good morning uh, and good afternoon to everybody who's watching this show. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us, Kavita. Now, we do these quite regularly. I think we could probably quite justifiably call them a series of conversations because we've done quite a few now, haven't we, over the last 12 months? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Now, obviously, we're, we're into the depths of the very, or the depths of the start of the very beginning, if you like, of COP26 up in Glasgow. Very important um, sort of Earth Summit kind of meeting, if you like, and it's dominating all of our media. And mm. as expected, it's the usual suspects who are the heroes and the usual suspects who are the villains. Um, some people playing their part very well. Um, and I'm not quite sure what's going to happen. But I mean, what's your, what's your initial take on it from what you've seen so far of the coverage there in India? And obviously, you've been on the news quite a bit, haven't you, talking and giving your, giving your commentary quite rightly. Um, give us your view so far. You know, I've been, of course, since yesterday, it's actually a very auspicious event for us at this time of the year, uh, you know, for all environmentalists and change makers and leaders of climate change, whether it's youth or an older person, uh, you know, COP26 is really, really something we will be all waiting for all these, you know, last few years. So uh, I, since yesterday, I feel the, the best statement that I liked was, you know, that whatever promises were made in the Paris Agreement, it's time to deliver them in Glasgow. So that was a very, very profound statement, an opening statement. And I really appreciate that because all these uh, you know, leaders who are there are surely going to make tall promises and we are, going to, we are going to be witness to all the promises that are going to be made in the coming days. But how much is going to be delivered? That's a very, very crucial point. And ministers and ministers of environment from all over the globe are there. So let's see, I'm, we are all following it to see what is the conclusion on the last day. It's too early to make a, an opinion or verdict because it's just started, yeah. I was reading an interesting article over the weekend saying that COP, COP26 or events like that are mm -hmm. the very best and the very worst of the United Nations because it's <laughs> the very best because no declaration can come out unless all 197, I think it is, members agree to it. So literally, it doesn't matter how big you are uh, as a nation in the world, um, unless you agree with it, the statement can't go out. So obviously, there's a lot of sort of jostling and buying off and cajoling, I'm sure, uh, at near the end. But also, they said that's one of the things that is the worst thing about it. You know, a lot of people are calling maybe now that what we really need to do, now we know what we need to do. Uh, we should stop trying to get everybody's consensus and break into smaller groups which are about action rather than talking now you know you you've um you've had a quite a long and illustrious career in many things do you think sometimes it's there's there's too many people trying to make an agreement we need it in a smaller way so we've got action as opposed to people making declarations absolutely you know i don't believe that um... People say majority wins, but sometimes the majority can be of fools also. So, <laughs> you know, so it's not important that if so many people are agreeing to one thing that is going to be correct, the ideal would be, you know, to have a bunch of sensible people taking the, taking the drive forward. But because we have so many countries there, so let's see, um, you know, uh, I am sure we all know of two, four nations who are very strong and I think they would be uh, creating any hurdles which will come through to making one solid, profound decision or policy making. Yes, it's still. Go on, sorry. Yeah. So it's just like it's like you know waiting and watching the game. What's going to happen? It's just the first second day, so it's too early for us also to comment on anything. Yeah, I I, I like the analogy of uh, everybody sitting on the deck of the Titanic and the boats like this, and everyone <laughs> goes. Now we all need to agree that the boat's sinking before we can launch the lifeboats or do Absolutely. something like or, or send a distress call. <laughs> we're, we're already in a distress code, but it's also realizing and accepting that you are in a distress code because the denial is, I think then you're living in a fool's paradise if you're still in denial. I think climate change is no more a 
no more a game you can call it or no more a, uh, something which can be sidelined because for the past 20 years uh, governments were not even serious about it and 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 climate activists and environmentalists were seen as you know they are outland themselves it isn't like this finally those who now you know their efforts are showing color yeah yeah now, one of the difficult things, I guess, also one of the um, one of the struggles, if you like, is the fact that when you're from one of the nations like, I don't know, America or the UK or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, any of those more what we call those ones that are the main protagonist when it comes to creating uh, the environment that's created the need for COP26's decisions, if you like, you know, using exploitation of resources, coal in particular. Then you've got, if people were sitting with us now on this conversation from the Maldives or, you know, any of the outlying, you know, areas of like, you know, the Melanesia, you know, Melanesia or all these places that are actually the first real victims of, you know, changes in sea level and, and stuff like that. Then the conversation will be very much around our own personal experiences. But one of the challenges must be that, you know, someone like yourself, you know, who is an environmental activist, you know, cares about the environment and stuff. You're in a nation that's almost caught in the middle, if you like, which is, you know, it's rapidly developing, right. rapidly yeah, changing, you know, lots of um, you know population growth. It needs those resources of an industrial revolution in order to move itself forward. But at the same time, those develop those other nations are coming to you and saying well actually you shouldn't be building coal power stations you should be using solar and wind and all, that, all of which is still very high cost and, and sometimes i look at india and it's kind of caught in the middle isn't it it's between right. in the debate you know what i mean it, it can be the it can be the hero and the villain at the same time it must be quite difficult to talk to politicians about that kind of stuff because ultimately they're judged on what they say that's right, John. Uh, rightly said, we are in a very tight spot, I think, India at this point, because we are a nation of, you know, so much population. First, our, our biggest hurdle is our population, you know, and we are diversifying, we are developing, we believe in creating more smart cities for ourselves, and we and industrial growth but what is happening in between all this struggle was you know for rapid growth and you know moving forward trying to switch and sort of, sort of grow from a developing nation and the dream of becoming a developed nation is so strong the ambition is so strong uh, not only in politics but i think in every citizen of the country we I don't want to name, but we want to be this and we want to be like that nation and we want everything, the lifestyle, everything is, we are paying a price for it now. Mm. Our air pollution, beaches are dirty, our policy making is changing, you know, it's changing because we want to adapt policies which are already there in the developed country, but maybe as a nation, as lay people, we are not ready. So there is too much pollution, there are thermal plants, sometimes they are also closed down due to air pollution. So there is a challenge always, you know, one on one hand, we are trying to grow very fast. On the other, because there are so many other challenges, we are trying to pull it down. So I think the common man is also going through this tug of war. So but in between the race for development and creating a harmony with nature, speaking from an environmentalist point of view, I think we are still we have our own challenges. Yeah. And also, I'd like to mention that yesterday I was um, watching Prime Minister Modi's, you know, opening comments at. He did mention about climate financing, like you just said, developing countries. So I think it was mentioned yesterday, even other leaders whom I heard spoke about climate financing, and it was mentioned that developing countries, you know, need that more. And we are looking that from COP26, something you know profound potential will come out for developing countries to be granted more you know uh, climate finance because they need that they need that push they need that uh, give us yeah so yes <laughs> other countries other developing countries like us need that push and we also need a little 
more time lag because I, I saw that the net zero target for India. So Prime Minister Modi has said that not by 2050, so 20 years more. So you can see these are the challenges of a developing nation. It clearly states that we are still on the road to development. Yeah, I mean, because if we if we were to talk about any other, I, I don't know, point in history, opportunity, you know, if we were setting up a business together, if we were doing anything, you know, there'd be a, a steady climb and then mm -hmm. a steady decrease. Surely what we just need to do is stop punishing the people that are going to bear the financial burden of this so quickly as if like it needs to be done by tomorrow. You know, I mean, it's not like stopping, stopping smoking. Let's give up smoking tomorrow. You know, it's you could aim for something. Let's stop drinking coffee this afternoon. This is mm -hmm. it's going to take gradual change. And I think sometimes this is what wears people down, if you like, not people that are interested like myself or environmentalists on the ground like yourself. So the, as you said, the lay person, the person in the street, it always seems to be about set fixed points that are almost set in order for people to fail yeah. because they're un unrealistic. No one seems to be getting together and having a reality check that says, you know, 99.9% .9 of the science says we've affected our climate. OK, let's let's move on. What are we going to do about it? Who can do something quickly? Who's going to need a bit more time? Who's going to need the finance to help them? Who's going to need that? Who can use the technology but needs the funding for the technology? That kind of thing. Yeah, so um, I think that, you know, if we are only looking at growth and setting targets with a fixed time period, that's not going to be the same for every country because everyone's challenges are different. So I don't see any... Um, so I don't see any, you know, uh, you can say fault in, in maybe defining, maybe, okay, give two lines, two, de uh, you know, lines uh, of uh, timing, maybe for lesser developed countries, this is the time limit and for developed countries, which are already ahead of us. So they could do by 2050. And like, I think it's very reasonable because, you know, it's, it's a dream to achieve everything in that one particular slot of time that I may give or you may give to someone. But it's not not feasible. So I think we got to be more practical, and uh, also speaking of um, you know energy, as you, as we are going to talk about, of course, you know renewable energy and solar and and hydro and everything. So I think I'm not only speaking on behalf of India. I'm thinking that I belong to all those countries which are developing. We are still in the mode. We are still in the mode of switching from regular you know coal diesel petrol to renewable you know solar and hydro and wind and all that energy so uh, it's a, it's it's a switch and even electric vehicles for, for 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 beginners it's a switch it cannot happen overnight yeah now is is an interesting point for you because when i was reading your profile again yesterday um interestingly go having a look at your profile and stuff we uh, I notice you, you always talk about being an army brat, which I think is quite, quite, quite funny, actually. And having been in the army myself for a couple of years, a long time ago now, um, a lot of people, I hear a lot more uh, people use sort of you know, not so much military language, but certainly sort of you know, invoke history and stuff, you know. So like, you know, when we were in the midst of COVID, it's going to like, you know, we're all in this together, battle, you know, I mean, kind of lots of military related language if you like <laughs> that you and i you and i would understand now i also read an article um at the weekend that was talking about we almost need to declare the climate change i guess the, we're using the term climate emergency now more aren't we climate action we need to gear up a little bit more, more if you like you know what i mean so can you hear me okay sorry did i break up a little bit then john no i think the voice uh, it's breaking up so we'll do this again this question yeah yeah okay no problem um so yeah I'm, I'm hearing i was reading an article saying about like you know we need to almost approach the climate crisis if you like a bit more like the health crisis we did with the pandemic so we need to start using some more sort of militaristic type of terms you know what i mean declare it as an emergency that comes with those uh kind of um supports and mechanisms and stuff like that do you do you think that would be a useful thing if we were to gear up in the same way that we would fight a war that we we, we fight up because ultimately we're talking about survival surely 
Yes, because looking at the climate emergency, if I may call it, it's no more a crisis, it's an emergency now. I think we do need that military approach to things because, uh, see, if it's very simple. Let me give you an example. If I'm going with a car and I'm creating, you know, pollution and I have, don't have a proper engine, and if I'm not asked to stop it or to find, if I don't not going to listen. That's how the normal tendency of people is. That's how people think. Oh, there is no hard and fast rule. I can just get away with it. So I think the military approach um, is needed now because if if people are not gently understanding it's their responsibility, somewhere down the line, we have to impose it on them. I don't mean in a harsh manner, but it has to be imposed. There has to be fines. There has to be regulation on industries. And when you're giving no pollution, you know, uh, certificates for setting up of various industries, those have to be very, very genuine. You don't have to all over the world because a lot of things happen. And later you realize that, you know, somewhere down the line, government policies have to be stricter and implementation is the main thing implementation without any um, you know malpractices because i think that's also a big hindrance in every country we make policies but we don't know how to take them to the ground yeah yeah it's, it's, it's true isn't it it's just like as, as long as we're not punishing the people that are innocent if you like you know the ones that are on the receiving end of this emergency and making sure we're holding the people that can do something to account i guess that's i guess that's important so let's, let's just finish off by talking about air pollution i know we always touch on this subject every time we do one of our conversations because it impacts new delhi almost in a, in a, in a different way to other cities around the world i mean i know people will get affected by the burning of crops but for some reason it really does affect new delhi doesn't it and how, how is air pollution at the moment the air pollution today morning and Tuesday morning in Delhi is already very poor. The air quality is already across 300. And you know, on and I was, I was in Barcelona two years back before COVID, it was 30 there, just 30. And I'm sitting today in New Delhi with a 300 plus, and I'm finding it very comfortable because as a Delhiite, I'm used to a level of 800. 900, 700, you know, 650. So 300 is just the beginning for us, but it's sad. See, love part of their lives. So I think lifestyle adaptation also, um, you know, needs to be stirred up a little bit. We have to understand this is not healthy. And, uh, you know, citizens just can't keep taking things lying down that whatever's happening is happening. I think time to stir up the government bodies and tell them that no, listen, 300 is not good because actually it should be 60 you know anywhere close to that a reasonable uh, air quality for a person to have healthy lungs and you know we have uh, you know premature deaths we have babies in the wombs which are suffering we have uh, pregnant women who are suffering then older people are of course you know it's difficult parents who are 80 90 70 they're rushing to hospitals then uh, uh, it's and let, let's not forget animals here. They are suffering. Children are suffering. You know, we have schools shut down in Delhi every year due to air pollution. But uh, I guess we are still, uh, you know, dangling and who the real culprit is. Yeah. yeah. Now, I saw your, your news interview that you did yesterday morning and you were talking about, you know, politicians need to come together at the different levels, a local, state and the federal and start, you know, coming up with some decisions and stop being political about it. Do you see any progress um, on, on that side? Because sometimes these changes are small and incremental, aren't they? Increments for what, sorry, John? I didn't get you. Yeah, I saw your news uh, interview you did yesterday about um, talking about mm -hmm. politicians at local, state and national, uh, uh, federal level needing to collaborate more in order to work on air quality. Are yeah, you seeing any changing right. how they work together? No, I don't. I'm see. It's this. This game has been this thing. This challenge is with us. It exists with us because we have four states which are responsible for Delhi NCR's air pollution levels, and they are the Delhi government. Then there is Uttar Pradesh. Then there is um, Haryana, and then there is Punjab. So four major cities, uh, states of India, 
are at tug of war and head on with each other and the people are suffering the citizens are suffering because no one wants to bell the cat no one wants to say whose fault it is and who's going to solve it how how is it possible that i sit with you and with four chief ministers all the time and you know we keep passing the files to each other you are to blame you are to blame but nothing concrete has come out yet and i am only living in a big you know a uh, condition of hope that someone will you know at least come forward and say okay let's solve it forever otherwise this will keep going on because i have seen it for the last 10 years and every year during october november we are suffering like nobody's business and but since so long and how how much of the um if 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 the the delhi government had sat down with them and try to you know at least make some you know a uh, decision with them or some communication with them that listen we are listening to even the center even we are listening to your your demands and whatever conversation is happening but i don't think anything is happening about air pollution there yeah i mean just so just to kind of help me out here um we we often hear about farmers and the burning of crops being one of the main contributors to the air quality um in new delhi um what what kind of percentage of that is it is it sort of you know 50 is it 50% of the air pollution is caused by the farmers burning their fields or is it higher than that no well, i think it it should be around 50 to 60 because the rest there are a lot of factors which are other factors so stubble burning is one but there are other factors which we can work upon there are construction sites which are unmonitored there is traffic pollution then there is there are thermal plants there is industrial waste happening we are burning garbage you know on landfills so there is a lot of nonsense happening on our own part i'm not saying delhiites we are like pure and simple and then we are not at fault we are at fault also but of course stubble burning is major part so what happens whenever air pollution comes the government sits back and says the state government sits back and says oh it's not our fault it's the if there's the farmers in punjab but what about the suppose we say it's 50 50 right mm -hmm. even if we give 50% blame to stubble burning what about the remain remaining 50 we are not even working enough for remaining 50 and i think it was a joke that delhi is such a big city and we had one smog tower installed last year and then it was in the news that one smog tower i went on television and i said delhi is so huge it's got these 20 crore people how is one little smog tower going to help everyone's breathing here <laughs> so you know there are impractical solutions that are coming up and uh, then uh, you know then the government says okay when it's very highly polluted we are going to sprinkle some water on the roads that's okay but you know these are tiny steps you can't tackle such a big uh, problem by these little steps okay every step counts like i always say every citizen counts every effort counts keep doing it but please take a major decision on industrial you know the burning and you know the emission of co2 and uh, you know cop 26 we are all talking of net zero and look at us look at our carbon footprint here look at what we are doing how our industries are emit, emitting so much you know uh, uh, you know carbon dioxide so it's like controversial you know you say one and you do other <laughs> yeah Yes, I must. Have, I must admit, it was it was encouraging to see on the recent Earthshot Prize that uh, the winner for air quality was a very inspirational young man um, who's working with farmers around New Delhi uh, with a machine that, rather than burning the remainder of their crops, they can put it in the machine and make other biofuel. And again, it's it's, it's a small step. You know, he won a he won a million pounds, which yeah. is a lot of money, probably to you and I. but you know when it comes to tackling this problem it's only a small thing so if he can scale that up and get more farmers to use it it was it's good so it was it was encouraging to see that because i knew at least when i spoke to you there's someone trying to do something about that that small part doing their bit yes of course see such people i mean they are they're entrepreneurs right and the ideal situation would be for i always say that government body has to encourage people like these and you know why don't you put them into your policy making why don't you include people who are working you know so sincerely or creating some options uh, there are also scale industries who are venturing into electric vehicle there are people who are making bricks out of 
you know the air polluted air there's so many things happening so many things are happening uh, but it has to be on a mega scale little tiny bits are good examples they are motivation for everyone but then take it let's take it up on a larger scale why are we letting that one little thing becoming uh, you know idealistic and uh, using it in the mainstream wonderful kavita Ideas. thank you very much yeah, thank you for taking the time to speak to us today. As always, we have had the challenge of the internet, uh, which uh, some, sometimes works with us and sometimes it works against us. That's all right. No problem. And I'll speak to you soon. Stay safe. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you.